All right, welcome to part three of periodization, the final part, which we're going to take into consideration <clears throat> further programming considerations. So let's get into it. So one of the cons one consideration we need to put is in the last lecture we discussed that nonlinear seems to be ideal relative to linear when you're talking about trained individuals, but is that always the case? <clears throat> well, let's talk about this again. Your traditional one is going to be uh, blocked. You know, where you have a block, a concentrated block is where it, basically the, the mesocycle is limited to a few attributes. So you might have a strength block, a power block, a hypertrophy block. You know, whereas you look at weekly and daily, weekly is focusing on several attributes in each mesocycle. So you alternate the weeks of hypertrophy, strength, power, and regeneration. So there's a study by Hoffman, and I really want to analyze this. Hoffman basically compared weekly versus blocked in highly resistant strain individuals. So weekly was three five-week uh, mesocycles, um, which repeat it, where you had week one, five sets of eight to ten repetitions at 65-75% RM, short rest. Week two, five sets of five to six repetitions at 75 to 85% 1RM. Week three, five sets of three to four repetitions, 85 95% 1RM, long rest. <clears throat> Week four was power, 50 60% of 1RM, and complete recovery. Um, week five was more of a, a taper. So now if you go to the blocked uh, mesocycle, essentially you had a hypertrophy mesocycle for the first uh, five weeks, a, a strength mesocycle for the second five weeks, and then a power mesocycle with a regeneration phase for the last five weeks. Now, what I want you to look at here is <clears throat> essentially the top graph is a force power curve. Now, what you're going to show here um, and you know, this is real important to sort of point out is the force power curve. So if you're looking at the pre-values, So if you're looking at the pre-values, that's essentially the dark line. The post-values essentially are the, uh, is the dotted lines. See, this is a force power curve. So looking at power output at percentage of 1RM, and what I want you to see is that the blocked, which is basically they change it every five weeks, from pre to post, this is the top graph, power output actually improves. Okay, if you look at the weekly, there's no changes, all right? So th that's on the bottom part of the graph. So basically, um, there are also no differences in lo other lower body changes, but the power was better on the blocked than the weekly. <clears throat> now, why is this the case? Well, A... Because the block eliminating hypertrophy, there's likely less fatigue. And we know fatigue strongly impairs power. Se secondly, the last phase for the last five weeks was all centered around power. So that's just specificity. If you focus on power for five, the last five weeks, that's obviously going to shine more. So what this suggests is that regardless of what style of periodization you use, that a peaking cycle should be included in the program, which focuses on the primary outcome. So you could do daily undulating periodization, but you may end it with a block that is more traditional in nature. Okay, so for athletes trying to increase speed and power, a blocked or partially blocked schedule may be beneficial. But results are going to vary and differ for each group. <clears throat> There's another study I want to point out by Pointer. So... Uh, which supports my contention here. So basically, 
is a nine week study in track athletes, okay? And um, you had a, a daily group, so I want you to look Monday, Wednesday, Friday, okay? Now, they either, had, they either changed things up Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or they did a three-week block, followed by another three-week block, followed by another three-week block. So for block one, which is correspondent to the first three-week block, which is correspondent to the first day of the daily undulated schedule, they did strength endurance. So that's three sets, 8 to 12 reps, 8 to 12 RM intensity. Block two, or in the case of daily undulated periodization, Wednesday, was strength. Three sets, five to seven reps, five to seven RM. And then Friday was a power day in which you had repetitions of three to five RM. Okay? So what's important to realize is that on Monday you'd have like back squat, mid thigh pull, behind the neck press, bench press, dumbbell row. On Friday it was less fatiguing. You might have one fourth back squat, mid thigh pulls, weighted jumps, push jerk, and stiff legged deadlifts. Now if you're doing a block, that Friday would be an entire block. All right? So this is very important to understand. <clears throat> now, a few points I want to make. The average workout time was 50 minutes three times a week for the daily undulated periodization. For the block, it was 50 minutes weeks one through three, 40 minutes block two, and 35 minutes for block three. What does this mean? The DUP protocol, or daily angiogenic periodization, did not build into a taper, while the block naturally had a taper. So we need to realize that the, what's going for the block is they're tapering, fatigue's going to go down. And this is clearly seen. So once you look here, if you look at the traditional group, and you look at peak force, so you have time point one, which is baseline, time point two, which is at the end of block one, time point three, end of block two, time point four, end of block three. And what I want you to notice is what sort of happened. If you look at strength, strength from time point one to two went from 237 to uh, 239 to 249 time three, but then it jumped to 271 kilograms on the, after the taper. So that's a clear taper effect, 249 kilograms to 271. However, <clears throat> if you look at the, at the other group, particularly when you look at like uh, the back squat, if you look at the back squat, first off, the isometric strength was stagnated from time point three to four. And if you look at the squat from time point three to four, it went from 143 kilograms to 133 kilograms. That's a clear overreaching and um, in indicator and a need for a taper. So what, what we're seeing here is not that traditional is better than daily angulated periodization, but regardless of what you do, you need to taper at the end of your cycle. And I can't emphasize that enough if you're going to peak for your event. <clears throat> so we again see that here. We have the traditional block periodization, which is TRA. Look at rate of force development. It goes up in the traditional, and it actually goes down in the daily angulated periodization, a clear overreaching effect. So next question we have is, what about variation within a workout? So this is a good study by Stretter, um, and it was a, a dissertation. Basically, they had linear periodization in which they had 8, 6, and 4 RMs divided respectively into three mesocycles. Then another group where essentially every workout they performed all three rep ranges, uh, alternating the order they were performed each time. So the, yeah, the variable was changed up, uh, each, which had all three in one workout and traditional, which essentially varied it per mesocycle. <clears throat> so if you look at strength gains, uh, essentially all the way on the leg press. By the third time point, you notice that the variable and traditional both gain the same amount of strength. So varying it within a workout doesn't seem to be any better than um, varying it from mesocycle to mesocycle. Now let's talk about the impact of linear versus nonlinear on hypertrophy. 
Unfortunately, to date, all of that data is mostly in untrained people. So you look at linear versus linear and untrained people, and you look at <clears throat> the elbow flexors or sensors in the Sineo study, and basically what you see is that the elbow sensors change. The OP is basically the, the nonlinear group. The LP is the linear group. Um, in the elbow flexors, we see that muscle thickness went up in the OP, which is the nonlinear, but did not go up in the linear compared to the control. So basically, the point is that it seems to be beneficial when we're talking about, you know, this programming effect for hypertrophy, at least in untrained people. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a new concept called flexible periodization. And <clears throat> this is real cool. You know, basically as, a, as someone who programs, you know, if I, if I have you go hypertrophy Monday, you know, strength Wednesday, whatever Friday, what if you don't feel like you're ready when you hit your strength workout? You know, so what flexible periodization basically does is says you need to complete these two or three workouts in a given week, but you pick them based on how you feel that day. So if you feel kind of good, you know, but you're not feeling super strong, that's going to be more of a hypertrophy day. You know, if you feel super strong that day and like you could lift the world, it's going to be your strength day. If you're like so-so and you don't feel like you can have the endurance to do the hypertrophy or the power, or the strength day, that's going to be your power day. That's what they did here. So they took 16 beginner weight training students and they assigned them to a flexible group or a nonlinear group. All right, both had the same total training volume. <clears throat> so basically, they had uh, assignments of 10, 15, and 20 RMs. Uh, but again, the, the flexible group could choose what day they did that. What, you want, what I want you to see here is that the flexible group gained more strength than the non-flexible group. So FNL is flexible, NL is not. And look how much strength they gained post-test. So this suggests that there should be some sort of auto-regulation you know, with the athlete. And that's very, very important that you take into consideration how the athlete feels. And that's the psychology behind programming. Speaking of auto-regulation, a lot of strength coaches will define their programs as a percentage of a one repetition maximum. Now, while that might be okay, there are some issues with that. What if you have an athlete who comes in and, for example, in this study by man, they had athletes come in and use a fixed percentage of their 1RM. So you start off and they told the athlete, hey, you're going to lift 10 reps at 70% of your 1RM for two weeks, then 6 at 80%, then 4 at 84, 85%. Now, while that might work, there are some problems with it. Um, what if you come in and you can't perform 10 at 80%? Or what if you can perform more? That's where autoregulatory training comes into play. In the second group, basically, they use RM loading schemes. So they predicted their 10 RM, and they made adjustments so the subjects could lift more or less than 10 RM. Same thing for the 6 RM and finally the 4 RM. So the volume intensity... Um, of the auto regulator were set each day and weekly by the individual's performance, not on some set percentage of the 1RM. <clears throat> if you look at bench press, squat, uh, and repetitions performed on bench press, they were always better with the APRE, which is the auto regulatory group, compared to the linear. So again, you have to take into consideration what the athlete can do that day. Last question is, if, if you're going to do a daily model and you're training for strength, for example, what's the order, the ideal order? Well, the existing model has a hypertrophy strength power order. So Monday might be hypertrophy, Wednesday might be strength, and Friday must, might be power. So the question is, is that really ideal? So I want to point something out to you. This is an isometric squat strength. And basically, they had athletes perform hypertrophy days, strength days, power days, and control days. So, <clears throat> the black is the hypertrophy, and the open circles are the strength. What I want you to notice is that after the hypertrophy day, those, 
those two groups that dropped their percentage of max force, most were the hypertrophy and strength. And they were still down 24 hours later. However, if you look at the power group, they went down barely, and they are right back up after 60 minutes. Power is not very fatiguing. Rate of force development, same thing happened. So what it says is that hypertrophy is the most fatiguing, strength is second most fatiguing, power is very little fatigued. So would it make sense to have someone start with hypertrophy, and then Wednesday when they're clearly not recovered, do strength? Probably not, because that's going to impact the strength. So this is a study we did back at Florida State, and we basically tested that. We had hypertrophy day one, strength day two, power day three, or hypertrophy power strength. <clears throat> now, basically what I want you to notice, their totals were the same at the beginning, but the hypertrophy power strength group put on about 20 more pounds on their total than the hypertrophy strength power, power group. So again, it seems that power should be in between because less fatiguing and you're more ready to go on Friday. Now everything that you might think about is customized ratio. It's likely that uh, you should customize your ratio of daily angulated periodization. So if you're on a hypertrophy block, you might have a 2 to 1 hypertrophy to strength periodization split uh, with one traditional hypertrophy, one heavy hypertrophy, and one strength day, which emphasizes the higher end of the strength range. Thank you.